Alex, are you ready for some questions? Yeah, I am. Awesome. Great. So the first one that I see in the chat, thanks for joining us, by the way, for the it's question. Great to answer. be with you. You guys okay? Yeah, doing well. <laughs> um, so the first question is from Ron Eisenman, and he said, um, what do we know about the basis for Sparks' decision to halt the killing? Was he particularly religious? Did he read philosophy? Was he just an average soldier who came up with his moral decision on his own? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. I, I wish I uh, had been there to ask him just after he stopped the killing. I think that m most of it um, was down to um, his upbringing, um, his education, his parents, etc. And I think that he was also very well trained. And um, that's what he did was what a good officer does. Um, but I think there was more to it than that. I think that um, he was someone that um, was by that stage of the war was, um, was kind of re repulsed and revolted by killing. I think he'd seen so much that um, he just wanted it to end and this was um, unnecessary. Um, in fact, he was interviewed back in the 19, early 1990s and he said that he at no point in the war had sanctioned what he called unnecessary killing. So Necessary killing would be, for example, if you were, um, if you refused to surrender in a German village in early April 1945, if he didn't see uh, reports that uh, white sheets were hanging from windows, that, that uh, it seemed that a, a village or a community was not going to surrender, if that would incur high casualties among his men, then as he uh, told me, he, he didn't have a problem with destroying that village or that town, um, anything that stopped them or got, got in their way, um, that was fair play. But when it was unnecessary, when um, the enemy had surrendered, when the enemy were no longer a threat to you, um, that was unnecessary killing. And he, he, at no point in the war did he ever sanction that. And I think there's a very important distinction between necessary killing and unnecessary killing, um, which opens up a big debate, but I think it's a, uh, it's certainly something that he was very um, believed in very strongly that there was a clear demarcation. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is from David Trail, and he asks, what is your next project? Um, I'm writing about a bunch of guys from the 3rd Division. So the 3rd um, Division actually fought shoulder to shoulder with the 45th, the Thunderbird Division, um, all the way from Sicily, through to um, southern Germany uh, in many of the same battles, Anzio, Salerno, um, etc. And I'm focusing on four individuals from the 3rd Division, including Audie Murphy, who's the most decorated soldier in US history. Uh, the 3rd Division had uh, 40 recipients of the Medal of Honor in World War II, uh, which is by far the highest number. Um, if you look at the 101st Airborne, um, the so-called Band of Brothers, that's the E Company from that division, um, were the Band of Brothers, and as we all know, they won World War II. Um, just that one unit won <laughs> everything. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the 101st Airborne uh, were in combat on the line for 117 days. Um, they were amazing, of course, but they got to go back to England and, and date English girls and have bacon and eggs for breakfast and the, uh, the dog-faced soldiers of the 3rd Division didn't get to do that. They actually were in combat for 635 days, which is the longest that you could have been in combat in World War II in Europe. Uh, and that's why they received the most medals, because they fought for longer and therefore harder, and uh, they actually had the highest number of fatalities and casualties because they just were fighting for so, so long. So I've chosen... Um, Audie Murphy and then um, f three other guys from the, uh, the same regiment, the 15th Infantry Regiment, um, and um, they became some of the most decorated soldiers, uh, not only of World War II, but in history. Uh, one of them includes, I won't bang on too long, but one of them includes a guy called Morris Britt. So if we have any teachers from Arkansas, are you impressed by my pronunciation as a limey of Arkansas, not Arkansas? Arkansas, if you come from Arkansas, 
Um, one of the guys I'm writing about is a superstar from Arkansas, and he's called Morris Britt. And um, unbelievably, he became the first American ever, uh, think about this, first American ever to win every single medal for, for uh, courage in a, in, a, in a single war. So he, in 1943, in November 1943, his actions ended up um, with him uh, receiving the Medal of Honor, and that meant that he had the Bronze Star, the Silver Star, the DSC, and the Medal of Honor, and he was the first Yank, first American to ever do that. So he's one of my guys too. So um, they're all, they're awesome guys, awesome awesome guys, and uh, it's a kind of a follow up to the Liberator in a way, um, but it's about the Medal of Honor, about um, the weight of that medal, its symbolism, um, how you have to try and live up to it when you come home, um, and about immense courage and bravery and um, some extraordinary moments in World War Two. So that's I'm trying to get to the end of the first draft right now. I've been blessed to be able to do it. Uh, and I have to say that um, my enforced lockdown um, has been pretty good in terms of productivity. But anyway. Great. Thanks. <laughs> All right. From Shannon Mathis, um, she asks, when will the movie be out, I assume, of The Liberator? Uh, I hope it'll be out next May for Memorial Day. There's no fixed date, but I hope it comes out... Uh, sometime before I, I kick my bucket, so to speak. I'm, I'm hoping pretty soon. Awesome. Um, from Steve Vita, do you think American bombers should have bombed the camps? Because um, he says he believes there was a chance that they were considering this. Uh, simple. My, my answer to that, and it's my view, it's not, any, not, not, not something that should be attached to any institution. I, I think we should have, yes. We absolutely should have should have flattened Auschwitz as soon as we heard about it, definitely. We flattened a lot of other um, key installations and uh, targets uh, not that far from, from Auschwitz, and uh, we didn't have a problem with firebombing Tokyo in one evening, killing over 120,000 civilians in one evening uh, in Japan. Um, so, I, yeah, we absolutely should have flattened it. Anything that was to do with the final solution, um, gone. Bye-bye. Okay. All right. From Raymond Sun, um, what sparked your research in Felix Sparks? How did you find out about his story, and did he face any consequences for the massacre at Dachau? Wow, you have great questions. Fantastic questions. Um, the reason why I, the thing that sparked my interest, if you like, in Sparks um, was the I did a Google search uh, a long time ago, and I plugged in uh, Dachau concentration camp liberation. I was looking for a story about liberators and I wanted to do something that was kind of, that would, where the climax of the narrative would be liberation because the point, the point of the book is that, you know, what, the day after the 45th oh, yeah. Division went into Dachau, um, there was a division newspaper um, that had a headline, this is why we fought. Um, so the liberation of the camps really gave a moral reason, a very clear moral reason for the huge amount of sacrifice and violence, etc., uh, It was something that even if you had fought for so long and at many times ordinary GIs wondered what the hell they were doing in Europe a long way from home, um, but none of them had any question about why they'd fought or why they were there when they actually saw with their own eyes the, the concentration camp. So I, I was looking for a, a, a climax, which would be liberation, uh, but I also wanted to tell the story of the journey to get to that, that point of, of, of realizing finally why um, so many had had to die. Uh, and I came across the image of Sparks with the, with the, with the pistol that you've just seen. And uh, when I read the caption, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Felix Sparks stops his men from massacring SS soldiers at Dachau, I was like, oh my God, that's, an, that's extraordinary. Um, not only the story of the, of the shooting, but uh, just the image of this, lanky American um, Sparks. I was like, wow, who is that guy? That's, a, that's an interesting character. Um, so that's, that's what got me interested. Um, and yeah, there was, there was a, a full Inspector General's uh, investigation into the shooting. Um, uh, two or three guys were court-martialed, but the, um, the court-martial proceedings were dropped. No one wanted to have this happen 
at the end of the Second World War in Europe when so many had been sacrificed. And Sparks was not found guilty of any, any accusation, though it was um, quite the opposite. He, uh, uh, several of his guys testified that he'd stopped the shooting and that he'd, be- he'd done everything he could to try and control what was a, a crazy situation. Uh, Sparks told others, not me, but he told others that he'd actually had a meeting with Patton uh, in, uh, later in May of 1945. He'd been called back from Le Havre in France. He's about to cross the Atlantic and go home. And he was called back to, uh, of all, to see of all people Patton. And uh, the way that the story goes is that uh, Sparks walked in, sat down in front of Patton, and uh, Sparks said that uh, he was surprised that Patton had such a, a high-pitched voice. He said, didn't, it didn't sound like the tough guy that we've seen in movies. Um, and Patton said, uh, were you with the 157th Infantry Regiment in Sicily? And Sparks said, yes, I was in Sicily, I was in Salerno, I was at Anzio, I was in southern France. I went all the way uh, to the very end from the very beginning. And uh, Patton sort of nodded, and then he had a bunch of papers on his desk. These were, uh, apparently they were uh, formal charges or uh, an inquiry into Sparks' actions. And um, Patton apparently, legend has it, the story has it, he dumped the papers into a waste, pen, waste paper basket and said, uh, thank you, you've been a good soldier, now go home. So uh, see, um, the, the problem for Sparks was that after the war, these images uh, of the shootings, um, not of him stopping the shootings, but of the piles of dead bodies, they reappeared. And um, uh, the stories were, wild stories appeared that, he, that his men had killed 500 of the Germans, that this was a terrible, terrible massacre, that uh, Sparks had ordered it, that he hadn't stopped it. And there was no proof that Sparks had actually done what you've seen him doing. Um, those images uh, only uh, appeared, only were found in the early 90s. And uh, the guy that found them uh, actually went to a reunion where Sparks and the 157th were meeting, I think, for one of the first times. And um, the guy pulled out the images of Sparks with the, his pistol, and he showed them to then General Sparks, and then General Sparks started to cry. He said, that's me. I, have the, I, I know it's me because I've got that map in my pocket. I always had a map in my pocket there. And um, he was very, very, very moved because here finally was pictorial evidence of the fact that he hadn't ordered this massacre, that he'd done the right thing, that he was a, an officer of integrity and decency and hadn't allowed this massacre to occur. But until that point, he had to live under the, the, the shadow and the, the cloud of suspicion and doubt. And uh, I think it was a, a reason why the, the images are so powerful is because they liberated Sparks himself from this false accusation, from this, this uh, gnawing wound, as he described it, this, this, this lack of confidence in his character and his leadership that existed for decades after the war. Great. Thank you. Um, just a brief note before I go on to the next question. Um, I've gotten a couple of mess- private messages from people saying that people are physically raising their hands on video. Um, that's awesome. I'm going to try to monitor that, but I can't see all the videos at once. So if, if I don't get to you and you're getting frustrated, please either use the raise hand function on Zoom or type your message into the chat. Um, sorry, I can't monitor all. Um, there's 126 participants right now, so it's hard for me to see everything. Um, I just wanted to put that out there. For now, I'm going to move on to some more of the chat questions because I can see those. Um, from Michael Barna, how did soldiers deal with PTSD after the war? We know more about this today. A little was known at the time. Uh, I didn't get the first part of the question. Was it? Sorry, how did, sorry. Um, how did soldiers deal with PTSD after the war? Uh, wow, it's a great question. Um, they drank a lot. They, um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to be flippant, but uh, they, they, they suffered a lot, but mostly they suffered in silence. Um, there's a lot of alcoholism, bit wife beating, a lot of dysfunction. Um, these guys had, uh, had been really brutalized, a lot, a lot of them. But you have to remember that um, the people that actually saw war in its full horror were a very small minority, very, very small percentage of the over, I think, over 14 million Americans that wore uniform in World War II. 
less than 5% would have been anywhere near uh, the front lines. And among that 5%, very few were actually in combat for long periods of time where they would be um, really, really profoundly affected. The uh, US Army did a psychiatric report in the fall of 1944 uh, because they were very concerned about uh, combat fatigue, as they called it then. We call it PTSD now because so many, it was epidemic, so many thousands and thousands of young Americans were breaking down. They were, they were going crazy, they were going insane, and it was a profound worry to the, um, the Allied se uh, Senior Command. Um, they were running, out, running low on men anyway, and a combination of venereal disease, of trench foot, of combat fatigue was really, uh, and desertion by the end of 1944, early 1945, was posing a really serious morale issue and uh, an issue of, uh, in terms of manpower. So this psychiatric report said that it didn't matter who you were, and they used the words, you could, it didn't matter, you could be an Iron Man. Um, it didn't matter. After 200 days of combat, you were, you were done. You were psychologically really badly damaged. You could carry on fighting, and sparks carried on, as I, I've told you, for 500 days. And some guys in the 3rd Division that I'm writing about now, they were in combat or near it for 635 days. You could carry on. But you weren't, you weren't all there. You weren't 100% healthy and 100% and, and, uh, sane. It was very, a very corrosive, very um, damaging thing to be exposed. That kind of warfare for so long, because what we're talking about in World War II is industrial warfare, and we're talking about flesh and bone and, and young minds, young sensibilities being thrown into a, a meat grinder, an industrial war that killed a lot of people very fast. Um, so thankfully with the Vietnam War, uh, we started to really realize just what damage was being done to young people. And today we are very much aware of the, the costs of combat and conflict. Um, but yeah, it sparks, uh, told me that there was one occasion, uh, after the war, he was walking around in Colorado and he was beneath some power lines and he heard the buzz of the power lines. And it sounded like an artillery, to him, like a sort of an artillery shell coming over. It had that, it had that, um, it felt very reminiscent of that. And he jumped to the ground and curled up in a ball on the ground because that's what he would have done in the war. Uh, and he said that apart from that, he, he didn't have any episodes like that. But I, I, he, he was an irritable guy. He was a, a short-tempered, um, irascible guy that was fairly quick to anger often and I is not some not a guy that he wanted to get on the wrong side of at any point after after the war so I think he I don't know what to what extent he certainly didn't drink um, but uh, I don't know I, I don't exactly know what it did to him day after day but some of the guys that served with him were very very badly affected by it and, and told me that they were that it was one guy said to me, and I'll be quiet after this. Uh, I interviewed him in Denver in 2010. And he said to me that, um, and he went 500 days in combat. And uh, he said to me that it was only after 20 years, uh, he woke up in the middle of the night and he was having a nightmare and he was sweating and he was gr clinging to his wife, sobbing. And he, he was shocked by this. He, he, he's like, oh my God. What's going on? And she said, well, I didn't want to tell you, but you've been doing this pretty much every night for 20 years. So, you know, that tells you what, what was done to those, what they brought home for our victory um, and so that we can vote. Yeah. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's powerful. Um, before we move on, I just, uh, Holly um, asked that I mentioned that we've been joined by two World War II veterans actually on the Zoom call right now. Um, we have a vet a World War II veteran, Colonel Frank Cohn, um, who uh, our teacher 
actually get a chance to speak with tomorrow. Um, and then Dr. J. Roy Rowland, who was a World War II veteran and former sixth term member of Congress from Georgia. So we just want to say thank, that, thank you to both of them for joining us and thank you for your service as well. Um, and I know Dr. Rowland had, a, I think, had had a question earlier and I think he's dropped off now, but um, if he comes back on, I, we, I'm sure everyone would love to hear from him. Um, all right, let's see. What other questions can we do? All right, here's a question from Cole Pomeroy. Um, did the Anzio battles or the Doc, or Dachau first liberation cause him the most pain later in his life? Um, like which one I think is what the question is asking. Where, did you have an impression about which one caused the most pain? Um, I, don't, I don't know which one would have caused the most. I think they were both very painful, but I think that uh, certainly the, the experience at Anzio was very harrowing. Um, he himself um, um, was, was there with his men um, for very long 12 days of almost constant combat. Um, they were pressed back. They were um, ahead of the Allied lines and then surrounded by the Germans and they were pressed back to a, a series of caves. Um, and um, the, to just give you one idea of what it was like to be in those caves, um, quite a few of the guys went deaf because of the, the reverberation, the, the effect of the reverberation from shell fire um, on their hearing. They were, they were deafened permanently. Um, uh, very little food. They went out of food. They were cut off. They were um, desperate for water. Uh, one guy ran out of the front of the cave and uh, machine gun bullets exploded all around him and he was he put his canteen into a ditch nearby to fill it with water because he was so desperate and the canteen was blown out of his hands by machine gun bullets. And when he looked down in the ditch it was red with blood so this gives you just an, an idea of what these guys endured for 12 days. And then finally they were, Sparks himself called in artillery fire. It's called pulling the chain. And that's when you pull the chain and basically you called in your own artillery and it was dumped on your head. It was landed on your head. So you actually called in your own artillery to, to shoot the hell out of your own position because it was the only way to destroy the enemy that are on top of your position or surrounding it and the Germans were on top of the caves they were dropping grenades etc so Sparks actually had to, to do that which shows you just how desperate things became and then when they received the order to pull back out of his company of uh, over 180 guys um, he managed to get about 12 guys together and for about five or six hours they had to make their way back through no man's land um, German sentries, German outposts. They didn't know at any point whether they were going to be fired upon. Um, sparks slithered into a, a drainage ditch and spent a few hours there and then finally um, managed to get back to Allied lines. And actually he came through Allied lines at a British position. We were very close to the, the, the Thunderbirds and it was a British artillery position. And Sparks told the story that when he appeared, not having shaved for almost two weeks. You can imagine how he looked, sort of blackened face, haggard, red eyes. And when he sort of staggered towards this British artillery position, he, t he, tell he told this story. I'm not sure whether it's completely true. He said he, was, he looked like such a monster that the Brits, the Limeys, uh, ran away. They were so terrified of what, of what he looked like. Um, I should add that that's the only time that the Brits have turned tail in World War II. We, we never ran away from the enemy, apart from that one occasion. But it shows you what he went through in, at Anzio. And uh, I think it was like he was, that was the, you know, he, he, he was in, he said that the, the, the greatest job he had, as I said before in his life, was being the captain of a company, a company commander in World War II. Um, so to lose that company was, Problem was, um, one that was, presented. was really harrowing using some things in your right <laughs> all right um great thanks alex um this is a comment and question from jennifer masood um she says 
I read your book, The Bedford Boys, as a part of the Teaching American History program not long after moving to Virginia and found it to be one of my favorite books from the entire program. I especially liked that you really focus on who the men were as people and where they came from. As a reader, it really gets you invested in their story as people and not just as soldiers. Did you meet with the families to get background information and what was it like for you to tell their story? Um, wow, God, you're making, me, you're making me feel really old now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did, I, did, I did meet with the families and uh, I was very lucky because I started the, I started the project in um, 2000, which is 20 years ago now. And um, number one, a lot of the uh, relatives were still alive. Uh, there were two widows. Uh, I interviewed at great length that um, I became quite close to. Uh, there were sons and daughters, obviously, uh, and there were several veterans. Uh, the surviving, the only surviving officer from uh, a company um, that the Bedford boys belonged to, a guy called Ray Nance. He he lived in Bedford and he was a, a lieutenant on D-Day. Um, and then a guy called Roy Stevens, whose twin brother was killed on Omaha Beach. Uh, Roy Stevens. Um, he came back, he was very badly wounded in Normandy, but um, he came back and he was a fantastic source. If you look at the back of the Bedford Boys in the, um, in the notes section, you'll see interview with Roy Stevens, interview with Roy Stevens, interview with Roy Stevens. Who, so yeah, and um, I couldn't have done the book now. You can't do those kind of books now. And I, uh, I'm finding that, um, you know, that I'm actually having to become a historian. And I mean that with some irony because before, I'm a journalist, basically, and, I, and I, that's what I always loved to do, was to go and meet people, sit in their, their living rooms, their kitchens, and, and, and sit there and drink coffee and, or in England tea and, uh, and, and listen to them. And Bedford Boys is a product of journalism, of, of many visits to Bedford and many hours with, with relatives and, um, and veterans who survived. So I can't do that anymore. You know, it's, I, it's, we have less than 2% of the so-called greatest generation alive and uh, um, I, can't, I can't get on a plane and, and go somewhere right now anyway, but even if I could, I, there's very few people you can, you can talk to. So now I'm becoming a historian because I have to, now it's all archive uh, materials. It's, it's finding things that no one else has found, which is really difficult sometimes with World War II because certain episodes have been covered so well. Um, so yeah, it was, uh, Bedford Boys is a very um, emotional, powerful uh, experience for me. I try and go back to Normandy every June the 6th and we, I take groups back there and we stand at the water line at 8 hour, 6.30 a.m., 6 of June, and we have a minute silence and we stand exactly where the Bedford Boys landed on Dog Green sector of Omaha Beach and where 34 of them uh, landed and of the 34, uh, 19 were killed, which is the largest per capita uh, sacrifice of any allied community on on d-day so yeah um it's a shame time marches on and uh you know all i can say is that i've been very lucky to be able to have, have met all these people and that uh, um it was a once in a life op time opportunity i didn't realize it at the time but now in 2020 i look back and we can all look back and think wow we should have talked to them a lot more we should have spent a lot more time with them we should have asked them a lot more questions we should be should have been doing this all the time while they were still alive you know Yes, certainly. Um, uh, Jennifer Masood says, thank you for answering her question. Oh, my um, pleasure. <laughs> um, from Jim Downing, he asks, why would there have been any Germans left in the prison camp when Sparks' men got there? Wouldn't all of they have all run? Yeah, well, they did. Uh, the guards left. Um, they knew what was coming. Um, retribution of some kind. Uh, but as I said in the presentation, Dachau was a, a large SS complex, so there was a concentration camp, camp KZ Dachau at the center of the complex, but around it were, was a training ground and a, a large barracks and an infirmary for the SS. Um, that's where the SS uh, were trained. That's where they, um, uh, in the 1930s, it wasn't just a concentration camp, what I'm saying. So when the Allies, when Sparks uh, liberated the camp, they found... Um, uh, I think well over 200 Germans still in the camp and they were, they were um, those SS soldiers that 
had uh, served on the Eastern Front or elsewhere that had nothing to do with the concentration camp itself, but was still in the complex. So a lot of the the, um, the families and the officers that had left to, in fact, Sparks described a very weird kind of surreal scene where after he came over the perimeter wall of the a complex, and not the concentration camp, the complex, he went through a series of um, um, houses, new housing, and there were beautiful gardens, the roses were in bloom, it was, you know, end of April, it was spring, um, and he went into a, an SS, SS house where a family had been living there, an SS officer and his family, and he saw children's toys left on the floor. Uh, they'd left in a hurry, basically, um, but the concentration camp guards, I, I think almost all of them fled. Thank you. Um, thank you to everyone for the part for participating. I think I don't see any more questions. I'm sorry if I missed your question, but thank you so much to Alex for this presentation and for your your wonderful answers to our great questions. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.